Hello and welcome to Beyond the L&D Bubble, Leveraging Community to Create Value. Our speaker today is Michelle Ockers, who is the founder of Learning Uncut and or, an organizational learning strategist. She helps leaders deepen the impact of learning in their organizations and create business value. She has expertise in organizational learning strategy, capability, uplift for learning teams, and continuous learning practices. Michelle is the Australian Institute of Training and Development's 2019 L&D Professional of the Year and the recipient of the 2019 Internet Time Alliance J. Cross Memorial Award for outstanding contribution to the field of informal learning. She also hosts the Learning Uncut podcast, a series of conversations about real learning solutions with the people who made them happen. And with that, I am going to go ahead and turn things over to Michelle. And she is going to bring us on this journey with her. So there she is up at the top. Hello, Michelle. Good morning. How are you? Or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so uh, a topic I always love talking about, the idea of community, the idea of networks and how we can leverage them to create value. Because literally when I um, found community, when I found networks, when I realised the power of them, it literally turned my professional development and indeed my career in many ways um, on its head. Uh, so I'm really excited to share with you today some of the value of creating community and leveraging community. And I can see in the um, participant list quite a few people who I'm already connected to. Uh, so I know that there's going to be um, a fair amount of experience to draw on in the room as well. And I'm planning on doing just that in this conversation today. Um, so most of my contact details are pretty consistent, very happy to connect with people to continue the conversation. Um, after the session, I'm very easy to find online and very happy to keep interacting around this or uh, you know any of the other topics here or just about anything else um, that you care to explore. So let's start with a little reflective activity. So hopefully you've got a piece of paper handy or if you like to um, you take notes digitally, um, this would be good to actually jot down um, your reflection on this question. So I want you to think back over the past three months, so really the course of this year so far, maybe a little bit further back if you had the uh, luxury of a nice long Christmas break, think back over the past three months and think about the most useful interactions you've had with others the things that most help you to get your work done, maybe to solve a problem that you've been grappling with and struggling to make some progress on, perhaps to learn something new, uh, be it something you learned uh, in a planned, structured way or um, you know, more informally. Um, maybe it's someone you've reached out to to seek advice about a work situation or uh, your career um, or just to stay abreast of change. I want you to really think back just the past three months and list out between six and ten people who you've had these interactions with and who's been the most useful in terms of the interactions. Might not be of who you've had the most interactions with, but who's provided the most valuable interactions of some sort. Could be face to face, um, which is a little rarer than it used to be, but it might be, you know, in more closed settings online, uh, one on one conversations you've had, um, small group conversations or it could be if you're active out on the internet, on social media, um, maybe it's someone you've interacted with, you've come across and you've never been sharing stuff um, and you've had some form of interaction with. So I'm just going to give you a moment to, if you're thinking on that, I don't want to rush you too much on this one, so I'm just going to be silent um, just for a little bit while you make your list of six to ten people. And if you're just joining us, we are just having a quiet moment of reflection on the question you see on the screen there. I can see Brandon's just joined us. Okay, so hopefully everyone's at least made a start on the list, perhaps got six, um, maybe ten, and maybe you've gone bananas and you've got more. That's fine too. 
So I now want you to do another step in this reflective process. I want you to think about how similar or different um, are the people on your list to you. Um, and just a few characteristics to get you started. Are they about the same age or is there a difference in the ages? Is there a kind of a variety of ages um, that you're looking at, if indeed you know the age of these people? In terms of their, their kind of work group or the organisation they work with, are they similar to you? Are they different to you? And expertise, what area of expertise, what domain do they work in? Um, you know, what qualifications or knowledge is their, their core expertise? Uh, plus geographic location. And you may have others that you want to throw into the mix, you know, perhaps gender, um, ethnicity and background culture. Um, so if you want to just, just take a look at the list and maybe just put an S or a D. Is, you know, are they similar to you or are they quite different to you, the people on your list? And then what we're going to do is go to a poll and just answer this question about how similar or different are these people to you when you look across them as a group? Are they all very similar right through to all very different? So there's a few um, options for you there. Just a reminder, you just click that circle. You don't have to have a submit button and we can see everybody's uh, voting in real time. Great. It's always fascinating to watch these polls in real time. Um, and when you have voted, I've got a chat question. I'll leave that poll open if people are still having a think about level of similarity or difference. Um, I've got a chat question here if we want to type into the chat box. How does diversity in your network help you? Um, and I know for some of you, uh, perhaps you don't have a lot of diversity in your network right now. We've got you know, all very similar at 8%, uh, mostly similar at 44%. So for more than half of you, you're saying at the moment when you look at that list of where you've had your most valuable interactions in the past three months, um, you know, they've been mostly similar or all very similar. We've got a balance in there, 40% uh, saying a balance of similar and different and 8% mostly different. This can change, of course, over time if we're changing job roles or moving locations. Um, well, I just thought three months was a nice snapshot to get a feel for this. So how does diversity in your network help you? Janet, uh, Jeanette, yeah, different perspectives. We're going to talk a lot about the value of different perspectives and what some of the research says about different perspectives in your network. Um, Christine being able to tap into different opinions. Sometimes we just don't see things um, or we are blinded by our own expertise uh, and we, we're not, um, it's not that we're deliberately ignoring information, it's just not coming through our filters, right? So diversity in our network can really help with that. Um, and Jill, different possibilities. You know, sometimes in the course of a very short conversation, I can, I can see things, people can point things out because they think differently to me. Sometimes even if they're in the same um, domain, and Kate, people that are mostly different in life help you to see different perspectives, consider things you might not have thought have. Yeah, so this point about different perspectives, cross-pollinating ideas, we're going to talk about that a little today as well and that cross-pollination of ideas and how that can um, strengthen our insights. Um, so I'm going to move on knowing that for sort of 50% of you, um, there's certainly opportunity to increase the diversity in your network, which is a topic we're going to be talking about quite a bit around the value of that in order to then leverage your community and network. So Karen, we will move on from the poll. Thank you for that. So one of the reasons for having the poll is just to get you thinking about where am I at right now to open your mind up for what might I take away from today's conversation. Um, so this idea of going beyond the bubble, it's about engaging with others either inside or outside of your organisation in order to leverage diverse perspectives and skills and lean into the value that being able to tap into perspectives and skills that aren't the same as us bring to us professionally and personally. 
So we are going to explore firstly a little bit more about the value of community, tapping into and amplifying some of the things you've already shared in the chat. Um, this idea of getting beyond the bubble, how do you start building a more diverse network? Um, and then if you have that diversity, how do you leverage that? And also how do you leverage community as part of that? Um, and we'll, we'll look at a nice little model um, around the difference between community and networks. And I just want to invite you just to use the chat box quite freely. Um, you know, if you've got an idea or thought is sparked or there's a resource that you think is relevant to the conversation, please just go ahead and use that chat because there's, um, you know, a lot of rich experience to draw on in the room as well. So let's look at the value of community. Um, 2020, of course, was uh, an incredible year where there was so much change and so much for us to try to grapple with and make sense of. Um, and I want you to have a think about how you figured out what was going on around you last year, how you figured out what was happening in your environment, in your organisation, how you figured out um, or, or made sense of this and figured out how to respond to that uh, in terms of, you know, what's your work role? How do you need to adjust things for yourself professionally? What's going to work in terms of um, home life, particularly if you've been in extended lockdown, potentially with, uh, you know, children or other people you're having to share a space with? Um, so if we're in the chat, how have you been doing your sense making over the past year to figure out what's changing around you and how best to respond to it? Um, I can give you a couple of examples and this may resonate for things I saw happening or, or I did during this period in particular and continue to do. Um, it felt to me like there was a lot more coming together for small group conversations in particular, but also webinars. Uh, I ran a couple of webinars early in the pandemic after lockdown, and there were way more people than would usually come to a webinar. I think people were just looking for ways to get input, new ideas, um, to have conversations with other people and exchange ideas for what is going on. How do I make the changes I need to make right now? Um, you know, in this period, um, I ran a number of sessions of different sizes, uh, which were in effect just listening sessions. So I ran webinars, but then I just ran these listening sessions to try to create places for people to gather um, and explore questions uh, that were relevant and immediate. So there was a sense of leaning into your network immediately to do this sense making. And I also have been running small mastermind sessions um, once a quarter where I get together four people uh, from the learning and development area and everybody gets an opportunity to share a challenge and get peer input. So leaning into the wisdom of peers has been important. Um, podcasts have flourished for me as well. So that's another way I've been making sense of what's going on is finding good quality podcasts um, that help me to understand the world around me. So Anna's uh, commented, reaching out to people based on values rather than other criteria that had guided you mostly before. Same organisation, same job type. Oh, okay. So you've, you've shifted how you're looking for people to interact with, Anna. That's a really interesting shift. I like that idea. Kate, you've done a career transition. Congratulations from accounting professional to content designer. Yeah, when things are shaken up, right, when... When the world as we know it is taken away from us and stripped away, um, you know, I've heard quite a few people talk about that opportunity to do some reflection and look at something different um, or maybe pursue something they considered, but, um, you know, there was no reason to get too far out of your comfort zone. So geo curation, yeah, reaching out for content that already existed, looking at what was already available, how other people had already made sense and shared things. And Christine, you really tap into an important point there about it being a conscious effort to reach out to people, particularly people you wouldn't necessarily normally pop in, pop out and be able to talk to, the water cooler talk. We're going to talk about water coolers and proximity in a moment. Um, but we, we did lose all of that bumping into each other in the workplace, in the physical workplace. Um, where some of our sense making certainly gets done in the context of our organisations. So um, sense making by its very nature involves uh, interacting either with content or at some point with other people um, in order to unpack what's coming in um, through our filters and figure out, well, so what? Answer that so what question. 
Um, I don't know if people are aware of Julian Stodd. Uh, he does a lot of really interesting thinking, writing and work around communities and trust building topics like that. Um, he was one of my guests in uh, a special series I did last year of the Learning Uncut podcast called Emergent, uh, where we explored the um, implications of the pandemic for the learning and the shift in business models and how can we emerge stronger from disruption. And we did an, uh, an interview with Julian um, and Rachel Happy from the Community Roundtable. And one of the things that Julian pointed out is we're really used to thinking about communities as places of inclusion, but he's sounding the warning that they're also entities of exclusion um, because the only thing that makes it coherent is that somebody is not in it, that, that uh, you know, we, we did find there are boundaries around community, although in many cases these days they can be quite fluid. But I think that goes to the, the, um, the warning around echo chambers uh, and that if we're only looking within our own communities and they're in our own domains and areas of professional interest, which by definition a community of practice is all about sharing common practice, we can be um, excluding uh, other types of thought, other perspectives and skill sets um, from the way we look at the world. Um, and Harold Jarkey does some really interesting work about this. This is a particularly useful model that I come back to a lot, uh, which is about um, the different um, types of groups that we interact with. Uh, and from that, that the idea where we've got project and work teams where we're having close interactions, uh, where it tends to be more structured, more goal oriented, and there's a lot of trust, that next level up is a community of practice where people we're interacting with more regularly around a common area of practice. Uh, and we're doing a lot of sense making, a lot of searching out for ideas, a lot of looking for ways to do our practice better so we can bring that into our teams and into our daily work. But then beyond that, there's the broader knowledge networks where our ties are looser um, and less structured. Uh, we, we share resources, we have conversations, um, and often these are outside of our own domain. But reaching out into those networks is super valuable because it exposes us to people who are more diverse to ourselves. Um, and we can bring in new ideas, new ways of thinking, uh, new tools, new perspectives, which we can kind of play around with in our community to make sense of them and figure out how we might use them. And then we can get to apply them in our work teams. So I think this idea of looking at um, your the groups you interact with on a scale of almost like intimacy and similarity or common interest uh, and ensuring that in order to leverage community, we're reaching out into network to bring some of those diverse ideas into both our communities and into our work teams. So I think that kind of sets us up for thinking about communities versus networks and the place of diversity and the spaces that interact with and the value that that brings us. Um, there's a really interesting study, if anyone's read either range or where, do, where good ideas from and both on the resource list that you share. There's a handout in the end in addition to the, um, the white paper on Emerging Stronger. Um, there was a study that a psychologist named Kevin Dunbar did in the 90s about creativity in labs. Labs seem to be a nice little contained place for psychologists uh, to do how people were interacting and he ended up focusing on these weekly labs which were a really common structure where people um, would get together who worked in the lab and they talk about confusing or unexpected findings that they were grappling and they'd ask for input from their colleagues in these lab meetings um, and what Dunbar found was uh, an analogy fest. He talked about people drawing on analogy to uh, create breakthroughs and different ways of looking at things. Um, and what he then found was the more diverse the base domains that the analogies were coming from, so the different places, the different areas of expertise, um, the different ways of thinking were being pulled in to provide the analogies, the more breakthroughs and the quicker problems were being solved. 
Um, and what was really interesting, he had two labs he was observing who were working on the same problem at the same time. Um, they were both studying E. coli and it was about proteins getting stuck to filters uh, as part of the, you know, the, the equipment they were using for studying these proteins. And one lab solved the problem in one lab meeting and the other went for weeks. Uh, before they were able to solve the problem. And the difference between the two was the composition of the group. And there were people from different domains and a wide variety of domains in the group who solved the problem more quickly. And this was a phenomenon he saw repeated over and over. Uh, so breakthrough thinking can be generated more quickly if you're able to access people or ideas from a range of domains. So here's another chat question for you. In your work in learning and development, what other domains have you borrowed from? Where else have you gone outside of learning and development to pull in ideas, frameworks, ways of working, perspectives, research? So if you can start sharing that in the chat and maybe some specific examples of what that's looked like for you. Um, I've got a few examples I'll share as well. Uh, the first is uh, design thinking, which is becoming more and more common as a practice. And uh, it's the first one, Christian, you've put in there. Um, maybe if you'd like to give uh, an example in the chat, Christian, if anyone else has used design thinking around um, any specific tools or approaches or frameworks or ways of thinking that you've used. Um, so from design thinking, um, I've got a good episode on Learning Uncut from a plumbing organisation, plumbing retail organisation called Reese, who used um, gallery walkthroughs, they used personas, um, they really involved their people from the storefronts in reshaping leadership training and also their whole blend of learning. They, in effect, use design thinking to design their learning, learning strategy. Um, I noticed quite a few of you talking about agile project management philosophy. We're seeing um, a lot of adaptation, of course, in learning and development practices uh, because of the need to move at speed um, and get out useful products more quickly than uh, traditional approaches where we build a whole course, for instance, before we put it out for piloting or testing. So we get early feedback, early user feedback, which again, you know, great ways sort of design thinking of involving more people to gather more thinking, particularly the people who are um, meant to be those undertaking a program or benefiting from your resources or courses. So quite a few of you working on um, agile wayfinding work. Yeah, wayfinding is um, interesting. I've not worked with that myself, but you've just given me an idea for something to go and take a look at. A lady called Trisha, who some of you may have been exposed to, uh, who is based in Chicago, um, uh, has spoken to me about wayfinding and the value of wayfinding. And knowledge management, Kate, we're going to tap into a little bit of that. And behavioural economics is quite interesting. Um, Google has uh, a, a blog and um, a set of resources around something they call their whisper course, uh, which is a really just a series of emails. I replaced a whole course with a series of um, emails to support managers to develop psychological safety. And they looked at, uh, they evaluated that quite closely and found that was extremely helpful. So that idea of drawing on nudge theory. Now, the reason I've got the elephant here, uh, who's familiar with the parable of the elephant and the blind man? Just give me a yes in the chat box if you're familiar with that parable. Um, the, the idea being if you, yeah, it's, no, Brandon's not familiar with it. Um, you can search it up on the internet. There's sort of variants of it from different cultures. But the idea is if you had an elephant and you had um, a, a series of blind men all around the elephant um, and just using their sense of touch to feel the elephant, they would describe it very differently depending on what part of the elephant they were feeling. And it's an analogy, of course, for people bringing different perspectives um, to something that they're looking at and working on together. Uh, so I think that's a nice reminder, the elephant and the blind men parable about the value of diversity. Um, and then finally, the last thought I wanted to share was it helps us to come up with better solutions. It helps us to diagnose what we're seeing. It helps us to explore business problems and opportunities um, with a range of different lenses or something we might be stuck on in our work and also to access a wider range of skills. Um, so if you're in an organisation that has you know, um, marketing teams, um, comms teams, data teams, um, business insights teams, 
Um, some organisations even have uh, teams that specialise in behavioural economics and understanding behaviour, behavioural insights teams. So all of these can be useful teams to draw on their skills. Um, I've, I've got one example from a company called Vitality who are a health insurance company in the UK uh, and Sebastian Tindall was a, a guest of mine on Learning Uncut and he spoke about how he built his team um, with a whole stack of people and skills that were not from the learning and development area and I'd be interested if anyone else has pulled people into their learning and development teams or is working with colleagues in learning and development who are not from a learning and development background that bring some other useful skills and perspectives. So he spoke about having a videographer, having a data analyst, having someone who'd been a YouTuber join the team. And these people all went about things differently and helped solve problems in different ways, creating a whole stack of better solutions. So if I can summarise some of the key values that you, you get from um, building a more diverse network and being able to draw on them, um, firstly, um, the idea of sense making, when we're in spaces where we're not sure what it looks like moving through that space and often community and networks can help with that to help us to gain clarity. Um, the second one is around generating breakthrough thinking to overcome our own biases and trained incapacity is really the blinkers that are created because of our own expertise and seeing things in a certain way. Uh, and the idea of slowing down our thinking to generate breakthrough thinking, and we'll talk about that a little more as well. And then finally, diversifying our skill set. If we can diversify our skill set and partner with people effectively, we can create better solutions because we can tap into skills and also capacity beyond our own. Um, and there is a blog post that I've referenced there and is in the resource list where I unpack these ideas a little more. So let's look at then at the idea of getting beyond the bubble now that it's clear that there's value and some of the ways in which building diversity into the groups we interact with can be helpful. How do we do that? How do we get that diversity? Um, and I guess the first question is, why is it hard to get beyond our bubble? Uh, so if we can have some chat on that, what stands in the way of building more diverse networks or reaching out into other domains? Um, particularly given 50% of you have, have said that, you know, on reflection, that the first exercise, the people whose uh, interactions with you have been most valuable have been mostly similar to you. Christine, organisational silos. Yeah, it can be difficult. Some organisations are still quite hierarchical with kind of rules and protocols about who you reach out to. Um, and it can be hard to reach out across the silos. Sometimes we just don't have visibility of who else is out there in the organisation, right? Particularly if they're large distributed organisations. Comfort levels, yes, we're creatures of habit. We tend to flock to those who are most like us and it takes more effort to push ourselves beyond those comfort levels. Time is a huge factor, Brooke. Um, particularly that, given that there are no guarantees as you reach out into different spaces and do some of the practices I'm going to share with you, um, there's no guarantees that it's like a quick return or you'll get a new insight every time um, or something you can apply straight away. But these things do accumulate over time and it builds momentum over time. Uh, Jeanette, don't want to step on toes. Everyone's busy. What do you need this for? Yeah, there's some really good um, thinking from John Stepper in his um, you know, body of work around working out loud around this idea of um, contribution and adding value. Um, and I know people are busy and we don't want to interrupt them, but many people who have expertise are actually very happy to share it. Uh, and it's a form of recognition, reaching out to someone and saying, I value your expertise. I, you know, I'd like, I'd like to tap into it and flip it around. Think about what it feels like if someone comes to you and asks you a question. You know, most times um, it, it does feel good to be able to share with others to help others to make a contribution. But there is some mindset stuff that gets in the way as well. Um, and the, the, the other thing I want to add is around social media filters and just the way our social media platforms work and that they can feed us up more of the same um, rather than feeding us up diversity. And we'll talk about a couple of tactics to try to get beyond some of those filters and break through those barriers if you're using social media and would like to use them to create more diversity. Um, the reality is that proximity matters. Uh, you know, it's, it, it takes more effort to get 
beyond interacting with people who are near us, um, be that physically or virtually. There's some really interesting research done from um, Bell Communications uh, in 1998. Uh, so it is a little bit dated, but I, I think if you reflect on the um, what this research is saying based on your own experience, uh, you'll find um, that there is some truth in it still. Uh, and what they were looking at was uh, the role of communications and physical proximity um, in the Bell Communications research area um, and the um, likelihood of collaboration between people based on their physical proximity to each other. And what's really astounding about this is how much that likelihood that people will collaborate starts dropping off even if you move from being on the same corridor to being on the same floor. And obviously this was at a time when we, we had more separate offices um, and it speaks to why one of the reasons why uh, more open workspaces where people are interacting more and where more thought is going these days into designing, um, you know, movement spaces, corridors of movement, uh, open stairwells, um, gathering places in organisations for people to have more interaction with each other uh, because it does make a big difference to how likely people are to work together. So digital communications, of course, makes it easier to find others online that you're not physically near. Thank heavens for that. Um, but then what? How do you create the opportunity to have virtual proximity, if you like, for it to feel like you're working in the same corridor with people, for those opportunities to gather around the virtual water cooler? Um, I'd be interested in any practices you're currently using to create that virtual proximity uh, and those less formal interactions that can sometimes lead to discoveries or opportunities for people to talk a little bit more about their work, um, you know, maybe what problems they're working on, what they're learning. How do you create that in a virtual world? What are some of the practices you have? I'd be interested in you sharing that. And Christine, I wonder how different this study would say now that we're also virtual. Yeah, I would be really interested, Christine, in this um, some sort of parallel study around virtual proximity uh, and what does it look like um, in terms of virtual spaces and substituting out these different types of physical spaces for virtual spaces. And I can see a couple of people are typing their responses here. the largest obstruction of virtual learning. Yeah, well, think about it. If you're facilitating virtual learning, how do you create more of these spaces where people have more opportunity to interact less formally? Um, and of course, breakout rooms are awesome because it's easier to have small group conversations and large group conversations. Uh, and I imagine most of you, if you're running virtual sessions, will have discovered the power of breakout rooms. Turning on the webcam, absolutely, um, creating some more intimacy in that. More community-based connections through Zoom, lunch and learn events, so less formal events. Um, some of those types of sessions I spoke about earlier that I have been running, which give people a chance in smaller groups to interact, to share more about their work. Um, I think the, you know, if you are an active social media user, you can start to see some ways that you can create virtual proximity. Um, certainly going on and checking your feeds um, and, and seeing what people are talking about, what they're sharing. Um, the idea if you're on Twitter, you can use Twitter lists uh, to actually curate lists of people who have an interest in different topics. And you can just go in maybe once a week and have a look at these different groups of people and bump against them and see what they're talking about, what they're sharing. Helen, the use of tools like Slack, Yammer, Teams. Yeah, I've been using WhatsApp a lot and Slack a lot more um, over the past year and they've been really useful. Making some space for social interaction as well in these channels is really helpful um, and a place where people can get to know each other to build up the relationship to share more. So there's a couple of things I wanted to suggest to you in terms of getting beyond the bubble, the practices that you could use for this. Um, the first one on the left-hand side there is an idea called purposeful discovery, um, which I came across through John Stephanie's Working Out Loud. We're going to talk a little bit about Working Out Loud in a moment. Um, but the idea of purposeful discovery is um, that you have a goal in mind um, in your uh, explorations with a goal. You know, I want to learn more about Agile. Um, I want to learn more about um, behavioural economics. 
Um, I want to learn how to improve um, the appearance of my, uh, you know, visual content, be it um, infographics or presentations, that you have some sort of idea of what it is you want to discover. And if you think about broadening what it is you want to discover, um, maybe it, you know, maybe your goal is around exploring a different field altogether. Um, and you can use uh, social media in a couple of different ways to help you with this. Uh, you can actually use social media like a search engine. So using hashtags, you can do a hashtag search on both LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and from there, you can find not only content that's relevant to the topic that you're exploring, but also who's posting it, who's having conversations about it. Um, and then you start exploring through that way um, and you can start following people. And on Twitter, you can set up lists, as I said, to create your own lists around a particular topic that people are exploring on um, and talking about. And then you can come back to that uh, regularly and see what else is being shared. Um, thank you, Kate. You've dropped in uh, the um, link to the workingoutloud.com blog, uh, which is a very useful resource. Um, you can also follow hashtags on LinkedIn. I don't know if people are aware you can actually follow hashtags uh, and check in on those hashtags as well regularly and have stuff moving into your feed. Um, the other thing to have a look at on both Twitter and LinkedIn, they by default determine using algorithms what you see. Um, for instance, uh, most relevant, most recent. If you want to see everything, you can change those settings so that you're seeing more different things and you're not just being trapped inside the algorithm finding more stuff like what you've already searched if you're interested in curating diversity. So do take a look at doing that. Um, Turina, you, you also use the idea of purposeful discovery. We're so hooked on SMART goals in organisations and even for our own professional development, but sometimes you don't know enough about a field to set a specific um, target for what it is you want to learn or what it is you want to do. So I think purposeful discovery can open us quite up quite well. The other, the other idea I want to share with you around getting beyond the bubble, um, which is more on the right hand side, is about going beyond your own domain and different ways you can get beyond your own domain. Um, and of course, there's so much available online now. You could think about your reading habits your viewing habits, if you like watching videos, your, your listening habits, um, if you are a, an avid podcast fan. Um, so go outside your own domain. Um, look at TED Talks from people that you, uh, you know, wouldn't normally interact with, fields you wouldn't normally be involved with. One of my favourite podcasts is one called The Knowledge Project by a guy named Shane Parrish and he interviews experts from all sorts of domains and just um, taps into the, the knowledge base in their domain. And I get a lot of good ideas and insights from that. Um, Kate, Feedly is another good tool you mentioned there. You can follow thought leaders through Feedly. Um, I think tools like Pocket allow you to follow up. Most of these uh, tools now um, where you can curate your own resources, you're able to follow other people as well. So that's a really great suggestion. Um, so apart from your own reading, watching and listening habits, um, online events, there are so many online events available now, many of them um, at uh, no cost or low cost. Um, webinars are a short investment of time. So you could be looking outside of your own domain, potentially, for online events to go to, or even if you can't afford the time to go to those events, have a look at who's speaking and use that as a source of ideas for people that you might want to check out online to see what they've published, what they're talking about, what they're sharing. So use it again, almost like a bit of a search engine idea and a research base. And then this last one is um, really high leverage. And it's the idea of following bound, what I call boundary crosses. These are people who have built diverse networks themselves and you can either look at who they follow, which you've got visibility of on Twitter, or you can look at um, through what they share. Uh, you can track down their sources. You can um, use them almost as uh, if they're really good at filtering um, as a way of feeding the best of their own 
diverse network into you. Um, so one example here is a guy named Aaron Pradhan, who um, I, I struggle to call him a learning and development professional anymore because he's so broad and diverse with his skill set and he does more than just learning and development work. But, uh, you know, I first came across him in learning and development circles. Some of you may already follow some of Aaron's work. Um, so if he's, he says, you know, if you look at Twitter, you wouldn't know what, what he stands for because he follows such a diverse group of people and he deliberately um, curates diversity on Twitter. Uh, and he goes in there, he says, when he's feeling kind of a bit more robust. Uh, to, because he might find things that are very different to his point of view, but he gets a lot of insight and picks up a lot of ideas, which he is then very good at sharing back out. So I would suggest Aaron Pradhan is someone good to follow, um, as is, as I mentioned before, the Knowledge Project. Um, RSS feeds, yeah, absolutely, um, using RSS feeds to curate your content. So um, Feedly is really good for that as well. And the idea with something like um, Feedly where you can curate your sources uh, and it, it, will fill, it will bring them to you, you're not getting stuck with a whole stack of stuff in your email inbox as well. So having gone to the effort of starting to build diversity into your network, which will take some time, but if you've got a particular area, if you've got a project you're working on right now or something you're learning about and you haven't really thought about the idea of in particular using social media um, or curating through something like Feedly, take a look at what you could be doing and start trying this idea of purposeful discovery, sometimes with some focused effort. You can build some specific knowledge very quickly, but also just generally interacting um, in these networks can help you to discover new and emerging ideas on an ongoing basis. So let's look at leveraging community then as you start building your networks and your relationships. How is it that you can start getting that value out of, out of them? So the first thought again, coming back to this idea that we span groups from networks through to communities, practice through to teams, is looking for bringing ideas from our networks back through our communities um, or uh, you know, if our own network isn't quite so diverse, finding the people in our communities who have those diverse networks and are bringing ideas in um, and then looking at pulling them through. So actively looking, interacting regularly in your communities to see what people are doing, what they're sharing about and being an active participant and sharing ourselves is one really valuable way to get more value out of your networks and communities. Um, the second um, idea, um, which we've had a link shared in the chat earlier, um, is around uh, working out loud. Um, so I'm really curious who's already familiar with working out loud, um, potentially has been in a working out loud circle. If you can just tap a, tap a yes in the chat if you've already come across working out loud and tried some of these practices. Um, there's a number of elements to working out loud in, in the approach that John Stepper proposes uh, and he's, um, he's got a, a guided mastery program that you can do with a small group of peers that's available for free on his blog site and I've got a link to um, working out loud in the resources. But one key element, some of you may have come across Jane Bozarth and she talks about showing your work. This is the making your work visible. Um, it's really valuable for discovering other people because they can find you through your work. Uh, so finding ways to let people know what you're working on, how you're going about it, what you're learning um, through a working out loud practice is really helpful. One of the things I think is super valuable, or two of the principles here and the elements that are super valuable is this idea of engaging with generosity um, and contributing to others. Um, answering their questions, sharing resources where they're going to add value, uh, builds relationships. So our interactions and being of use to people builds relationships, builds trust. And the more we can do that, the more likely we are to receive back because people uh, will, will have a sense of what we're working on, what's important to us and be able to sense the opportunities to contribute more to us in all sorts of little ways. Um, the other idea, this discovery idea and purposeful discovery, um, there's a lady called Beth Comstock who used to be the VP of marketing for many years at General Electric and this is a wonderful book that she's written called Imagine It Forward 
um, which I recommend uh, to any learning and development professional. I took a lot out of this. And one of the things she talks about is this idea of discovery um, and going out into the world with a sense of discovery and thinking about the world as your classroom and having some practices to help you to extract ideas uh, to help create the future, be that just a different future for yourself or, um, you know, creating the future through some sort of bigger projects and collaborations. Uh, so my question for you here is, how do you engage the world as your classroom? What are some of the ways you can approach the world um, to, to discover things? Uh, I'm going to share a few thoughts here, but very interested in what you have in the chat. Um, and some of what I'm going to share might be a little unusual. You might not have come across it before. Um, the idea of unusual experiences, uh, you know, getting out of your normal comfort zone, um, going to events, uh, you know, online events, um, if that's what is available to us at the moment, physical events where that's available, going to exhibitions on things we might not normally be interested in, leafing through magazines. I love going to the hairdressers. Um, partly because they have magazines I wouldn't normally pick up. Um, and in particular, my hairdresser has some magazines which are targeted at men. And I find picking them up, um, they, they have different topics, um, the graphic design, the feel, um, the interviews are all things that I wouldn't normally come across. So I normally have a notebook with me when I go to the hairdressers because I'm bound to come up with a few ideas or I snap some things on my phone um, that stimulate a bit of thought and I, I, I see different people through exposing myself through these magazines in a different way. Um, the second suggestion is watching trends. Um, there's actually a site called trendwatching.com, trend watching. Uh, where you can sign up and they'll send you a, a newsletter with a different trend every week or there's a whole stack of, um, of course they've got a subscription model, but there's a whole stack of stuff that's free to access to look at what trends are going on in different fields. Um, so that can be a useful form of discovery. Um, Kate, travelling and staying in local areas instead of tourist traps, yeah. I find um, visiting areas where I haven't been, even in my own city, going to suburbs that aren't my normal suburb, maybe where the type of people that would go aren't the type of people I would normally uh, mix with, be exposed to, uh, particularly if you live in a larger city with different districts, can be really valuable. Um, walking, I just find walking around when I'm travelling, uh, walking around cities, looking at things differently, um, or indeed the countryside, can be super helpful and striking up conversations with people. Um, the next idea that I wanted to share is around the idea of finding a spark. And a spark is actually a person. There's someone who's got a different perspective who can challenge your team or you to think differently, particularly if you're kind of stuck on a problem. Um, it's a bit like recreating that lab meeting where maybe you don't have the diversity in your team, going and finding someone. Um, I had a really interesting experience. I did some work at Qantas where we were looking at uh, their operating model for learning and development um, and we were looking at business partnering um, and there was someone in the finance area who'd set up their finance business partnering and he had some very different ideas uh, from the human resources area around what business partnering might look like so we brought him in to really challenge the thinking we'd done on business partnering and to shake things up and see things differently so find your spark. Sparks can come from outside the organisation as well. Um, the, um, the final thing I wanted to share here is this idea of mental models. Mental models are um, representations of the world that help us to make sense of it. Um, and they can be a good way of distilling knowledge from other domains. Uh, so I mentioned the Knowledge Project before. They share some mental models on their site. There's also a fabulous new site, a resource from um, Aaron, who I mentioned earlier, um, and uh, another guy named Shia Desai. They put the site together called modelthinkers.com. If you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to go take a look. Um, of course, again, there's a subscription model, but there's a lot of stuff available to, to look at without um, uh, any cost. And they send a weekly, uh, kind of a model of the week, a, a new model every week that you might want to use. Um, and I thought this one was particularly useful. This is the, uh, the model of idea sex, particularly relevant uh, to share with you because it's the idea that you can find unusual combinations between established ideas or models to create something new. 
actually need at a certain point in time. I'm playing around at the moment with um, journey maps and and be at uh, researching the career pathways of women leaders in sport for a and I've been thinking about how do I represent in a different way from normal career pathways what's actually happening for this women um, and I've, I've grabbed journey maps um, out of the design thinking domain and bringing that together with career research so looking at what I can create that's new there. So there's an example for you using mental models. Um, the, the next idea is personal knowledge management and knowledge management was mentioned early on around the sense making uh, when I asked that question. So this is a, um, a model from Harold Jarkey or a practice, a, a process from Harold Jarkey um, called Six Sense Share. Uh, and it's really about how we go out into the world, um, into the network to seek interesting people, to be curious, to explore with that sense of purposeful discovery um, and then how we make sense of that. Uh, and there's a whole stack of ways we could do that. Um, we, we can observe it, we can evaluate what we're finding, we can think about it, we can have conversations with others, we can synthesise it, um, this idea of idea sex, we can synthesise it with things we already know. What, what happens when I bring this new piece of information or new understanding or new perspective back this new resource, how does that mesh with what I already know and most importantly we can do something with it, we can apply it so that we can learn from it and out of that, out of that sense making um, which we do with both our community, our teams and ourselves, we can then share it back. So this links back into the idea of working out loud um, and making our work visible we can publish, we can comment, we can participate in communities and I really encourage you to take a look at working out loud and to think about forming a working out loud circle because what you start to realise if you do a 12 week uh, guided mastery program using the free guides that John Stepper offers with a small group of peers, it takes you through little steps at a time to start to appreciate that you can start building relationships with people in very small ways and contributions can take very small forms. It might be commenting on something someone has posted um, or reaching out via email to share a resource with someone or to thank them for something or doing an introduction and all of this starts um, to improve our ability to get value out of our network. Uh, so I would strongly recommend looking at a personal knowledge management practice and what you can do, um, simple steps you could take with Seek, Sense and Share. And then finally the idea of co-creation. Um, design thinking has come up. One of the beautiful things about design thinking is firstly it, it opens us up to the perspectives of others, both through that empathise stage where we're going out to look at the context of the people that we're trying to help with a solution of some sort or something we're designing, we're trying to get into their shoes and get their perspective, as well as in the ideate phase, inviting people from different um, areas, different perspectives to help us look at solutions and ideas that we might then take forward to test. Um, user generated content is something to encourage as well, to encourage others to share their perspective in a way that um, people can draw from it. So working particularly with subject matter experts or even those in your organisation who are learning new things. Often when we're learning things it's a great time to create content to consolidate our learning and share them. Um, so group thinking. Cognitive biases, uh, there are a lot of cognitive biases. They're filters, um, shortcuts we take in order to do our thinking and make decisions and we all do them. Um, if you layer then on blind spots created by our expertise, there's kind of a couple of layers here that can get in the way. Uh, and interesting, Daniel Kahneman who wrote the book Fast and Slow Thinking uh, and received, I think he got a Nobel Prize for his work around understanding these two methods of thinking that sometimes we think very intuitively, very quickly and our biases come into play, but in order to think um, more effectively and in a more considered way, we need to slow down the thinking process. Daniel Kahneman actually has suggested recently that even if we're aware of our biases, it's very hard if not impossible to overcome them to improve the quality of our thinking. So he suggests using structured processes to improve 
group thinking and you may be familiar with some of these. Um, I quite like the idea of a pre-mortem, which is thinking in advance of a project or initiative of all the things that might go wrong and that opens you up to ways of then um, addressing them. Uh, it's a, it's a, a little more fluid than a risk assessment and I think can be really useful. Uh, so we've had the comment that the brain's designed to take shortcuts. Absolutely. Um, it's just the way we function. So if we want to improve the quality of our thinking, bringing in new ideas um, and utilising them effectively, finding ways to slow down, to do some structured thinking in groups um, is a really helpful way if something is important enough. Uh, to take the time to think it through. So there's a few ideas there around um, having built a more diverse network or even in the process of building a more diverse network, how we can bring the ideas and then use our communities and teams to start to leverage them. Um, which brings us to now what? We've looked at the value of community and particularly in reaching out into networks and bringing diverse perspectives back through to our communities to explore and apply in our work. We've looked at ways of building more diversity into um, your interactions, into your network, um, to draw diverse perspectives from. And we've looked at um, some practices to help you start getting value out of your community. So here's a summary. Um, which of these are you going to try? Maybe some of them you're already doing and you want to do more of because you can see there's value to it. Or there's something here that you would like to uh, have a go at. So just share in the chat. Um, we're pretty much on time. I was hoping to have a bit more time for uh, questions, but we've got a little bit of time, Karen, for questions as people share what they will do. Um, and as you do that, I'd just like to remind you, we've got the Emerging Stronger white paper, which I co-wrote with Laura Overton and Shannon Tipton from Learning Rebels for Go One where community is one of the lenses we share, one of the new perspectives we've identified through these conversations that we had through the Emergent podcast. Um, one of the ways that we can shift our perspective and emerge stronger and more relevant into the future. And you can see the other three that we explore in the white paper there. So uh, some of you have seen that on the right hand side, you can add your contact details if you haven't already given consent to receive a copy of the white paper from Go One. So we may have time if there are any questions for a couple of questions. So please just go ahead and type your questions in the chat pane there. And if you do want to make sure you receive that white paper, put your email address in that uh, poll to the right hand side of the slides. It was a great session, Michelle. Thank you so much. I'm seeing some questions coming in. We just have a like a minute or two, unfortunately. There was a lot of information, but do know that you will receive a link to the recording. And uh, Michelle has prepared a handout for you for some of the resources here for you to uh, explore. And don't forget that white paper emerging uh, stronger in the L&D community that will be available if you provide your consent. And know that when you are typing your email address in there, that gives us the authority to forward your contact information to Go One, who will then give you access to that white paper. I'm really not hey, seeing I just any questions. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. I was just going to say, I, I really skimmed through a whole stack of stuff there because there's a whole stack of different things you could do, but there's quite a lot of the content in the um, handout you'll, you'll be receiving um, outside of the white paper itself. Uh, for you to explore and I just encourage you to play around with things and have a go and, and try some new practices uh, and see where that leads you in terms of new ideas, fresh insights. That sounds great and um, I'm going to just close things out since we are at the top of the hour. Thank you again Michelle for that wonderful presentation. It was really jam-packed with a lot of things for us to think about and how we can expand our communities, how we can reach out into other domains. I know there's a few marketing um, sessions that the Guild has done bringing marketing into L&D, how you actually have a marketing campaign. So it it's, gives you fresh eyes. It's really great to, to do that cross domain into L&D. 
So thanks so much for joining. And we do want to thank Go One, the sponsor of this particular webinar, and of course, Adobe Connect, who provided the platform for our session today. I want to thank all of you in the audience for spending time with us and uh, exploring this with us. So thank you so much. Uh, have a good rest of your day.